Hi, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Good, good afternoon, Sharada. Good morning, ma'am. Good, good afternoon to you as well. Yes, yes. It's so wonderful to see you. Well, it's wonderful to see you all as well. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Kind of introduce me to, to who's here. Uh, okay, we are about uh, 20 people, 21 people, including you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll have to tell me when you're ready to begin. Uh, yes. You're ready. In a minute. In a minute. Now, everybody else, can you? Are you live or are you just a stationary picture? Jessica, I see you moving. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning, Dennis. Afternoon, Dennis. I want you to know that I feel like a first year teacher right now. I've been out of the uh, presentation routine for two years because of issues with my voice. And I missed the Zoom period. So Zooming is very, very new to me. In fact, this is my first time doing Zoom. And I'm so incompetent in it that I have my secretary who is managing my presentation. So if there are a lot of little rough spots here and there, bear with me. You know, I'm a, a beginner and technology will rain and my goofs will surface. So um, I'm delighted to see, to see you here. I do have a question for you both. Yes, ma'am. Well, first of all, let me ask the question. Have any of you met Muska? Have any of you had an opportunity? Not, no one has ever seen none. him or nothing. Why don't I begin by introducing you to Muska Mosca? Okay, number 16. Um, yeah. <laughs> Can you do number 16? Yes, one moment. Um, the, first, the first glitch. You're ready for it, ma'am. Uh, so, what is it? Did you want to speak, Shirada? Yes, ma'am, please, if you allow. Okay. Oh, absolutely. I'm, yes. Um, first of all, on behalf of Chandrasekhar Agashi College of Physical Education and all my pedagogy colleagues, I extend a heartiest welcome to Professor Sarah Ashworth for you know, accepting uh, to have this session with us. We are really humbled and we are really honored to uh, you know, see you uh, online and be able to interact with you. It's, it's, you know, it's beyond my, um, uh, belief. just now I am in total disbelief that this is actually happening and I'm so happy. Uh, <laughs> I'll quickly tell you that we are a college of physical education who trained physical education teachers for the previous 40 years. And we are one, I would, I'm proud to say that we are one of the very good colleges in India. And we are really trying to give the best of uh, physical education, teacher education programs to uh, all the students who come to us. Uh, throughout the state of Maharashtra, uh, our students have spread and they're working as physical education teachers and some are also working at universities and colleges. And we keep striving to, you know, update ourselves and gain more knowledge and insights from experts such as you. So I really uh, welcome you once again. And if you ask me, please, um, you know, introduce you to the 
participants, I will request uh, Miss Jessica Debrio, who is my colleague uh, from Abu Dhabi just now, to introduce you, please, ma'am. Oh, my goodness. Over to you, Jessica. Uh, we, we can't hear you, Jess. Uh, Jessica, you are muted. If you can hit the button. Am I audible now, ma'am? Yes. We gotcha. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Greetings to Professor Ashworth, uh, teacher educators, physical education teachers, and pedagogues uh, that are gathered here. I would uh, like to thank uh, Shraddha ma'am for giving me this opportunity to do this introduction to of Professor Ashworth. It's, it's an, a privilege and honor for me, uh, especially to introduce you ma'am to all of us. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction of uh, Professor Ashworth to all, all of our participants today here. Uh, Professor Ashworth grew up in a family where, parents, where her parents instilled a strong work ethic, uh, importance of family education and personal values of inter independence and self-reliance. Uh, during her early childhood, Professor participated in sports such as fencing, tap, ballet, toe dancing, competitive gymnastics, tracks, and diving. Uh, she earned her MA from uh, University of Mississippi and a doctorate of education from Temple University in Philadelphia. And she met Professor Muska in 1969 at the Southern District uh, Physical Education Convention. And from there on, uh, she studied and implemented the spectrum in her classes. That's when it all began. And uh, for the last 25 years, Professor Muska and Professor Ashworth continued research and expansion of the spectrum of teaching styles. In 1973 to 1980, they received a federal grant to direct the Center on Teaching in New Jersey. From 1980 to 1994, they conducted a workshop throughout the US, Canada, Europe, the Middle East, and South America. They also, in 1984 alone, they conducted 87 presentations and in a, during an 11 month European lecture tour. From 1987 to 2008, Professor Ashworth thought the spectrum. And in the first four years itself, she, was, she received every teaching award, including the University Distinguished Teacher of the Year Award. I mean, that's amazing. That's really, really amazing. In 1996, she was awarded the honorary doctorate from the University of Ivaskila in Finland. Uh, following Professor Muska's death in 1994, Professor continued to expand the framework of spectrum and has been dedicated to applying the spectrum theory to all the fields and not just physical education. She has also created a Spectrum Institute of Teaching and Learning. And with this uh, brief intro, I would like to conclude with this quote that I read on the website by Michael Goldberger, which says, historically, if Muska Mostyn is the father of uh, the spectrum, Sarah Ashworth is the mother. And it has been Sarah who has single-handedly nurtured and kept the spectrum alive for the past 40 years. This passion and devotion that Professor Ashworth has is inspiring for all of us. And it is a pleasure and honor to have you, ma'am. And uh, we are really uh, glad to have you with us today. Uh, we are looking forward to an insightful and an enlightening session with you today. And without any further ado, I'm requesting Professor Ashworth to please take over. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Well, with that long introduction, the conference is over. We can go home. <laughs> Thank you. That was a nice review of my life. Um, since none of you have met Muska, would you like to meet him? Very quickly. Let's, let's play this, okay? Then As you can see, do I need to unmute? You're, You're fine. fine, I can hear you. As you can see, Muska Mostyn was quite a versatile person. He was a terribly charismatic teacher. He was adored by his students. However, one day, something very interesting happened to him. It began his journey of studying pedagogy. <clears throat> you know, before I begin this, I need to ask you one other question, if you'll talk to me. What do you know about the spectrum? Can you just give a few little facts? 
Name something that you know about the spectrum. Please remember that if you're going to respond, you need to unmute yourself. And please mute yourself after you give your response. Sorry, I can't. Yeah, we know about the anatomy of uh, teaching styles, and we know the various teaching styles that are spread across the spectrum. Say the last part again. The, the various uh, teaching styles that are classified as um, maybe product, reproductive and productive styles of teaching. You need to unmute. Since I'm not getting a lot of responses, let's, let's, let's go on. Again, if you can't understand me and if I'm not clear, please share with me. You're familiar with this, with this picture. With this over with this framework, correct? Okay. How did the spectrum start? Why did why did Muska go to look at this framework of called structure of teaching and learning? One day, a student came to him with he was teaching at Rutgers University, and he came up to him and he said, "I can't be you." That kind of surprised Muska because he'd been teaching them all of these wonderful ideas about pedagogy. And suddenly he has a student who says, I can't be you. And the student said, no, don't go away yet. In fact, I don't want to be like you. And that statement bothered Muska emotionally and cognitively. And he asked himself, what am I doing with my students? What kind of, what kind of pedagogy am I teaching him? Am I teaching him not, am I teaching him to be me, or is there a structure to, to understanding pedagogy? So he began this search to answer three questions. Is teaching independent of one's idiosyncrasies? Or, or is it, or not? Teaching approach. And the third question that he sought to answer was, is there, if there are, if there are many approaches to teaching, what differentiates one teaching approach from another? So these three questions guided Muska's study and investigation of the structure of teaching. And I think it's important here to note the reason why the spectrum became um, an, an interest of his. It wasn't because he was a researcher and he wanted to study pedagogy, but it was because he wanted to know if there was a universal structure, an internal structure, to the to, to pedagogy. And if there was, what was it? So I won't go into a long detail, but the, he answered he his investigation revealed three issues in terms of the study of teaching. He found that all ideas about pedagogy were approached from a versus um, uh, platform. And that means one, no not yet, not yet. Not yet. That Sorry. one idea replaced another one. And historically, every idea that came along in pedagogy was replacing an idea. So one idea would come in, knock out what was in vogue. Another idea would come out. Do you find that to be true in India? That ideas are cyclical. They come in and they remove. One year, it's a, it's a focus on on the emotions, another year it's a focus on skills, another year it's a focus on, on um, whatever the topic may be. So this versus approach to teaching was the first thing that he found that he discovered about the historical review of pedagogy. The next thing he found was that these wonderful ideas that were, that were out there that were being replaced really had nice ideas, but they didn't they didn't identify how the teacher was supposed to implement these ideas. Therefore, the teachers would implement these wonderful ideas idiosyncratically from their own point of view. And the third thing he found, um, those were, so those were the two things that he found. Uh, oh, and the third thing he found was that, had a, that all of these different ideas that were coming and going and coming and going had used the same terminology, but with different meanings. 
these go ahead. These three points, these three questions. Once he answered these three questions, he asked himself the question, what would the thinking about? Now remember, these three questions are what are how people thought about teaching and how we currently today even think about pedagogy. We think idiosyncratically. We think in terms of, of our idiosyncrasies and doing the diff different approaches that are out there. And third, we use terminology in a very mixed and confused manner. So Muska said, what would happen? Now, switch, please. Now, what would happen? If, next slide. Now, he said, what would happen if rather than a versus and an idiosyncratic and an inconsistent terminology approach, what would happen if we altered the counteracted those points and we thought of pedagogy in a non-versus approach, in a unifying approach, and in a systemic approach? So the, the spectrum's philosophical perspective of education is that it comes from a non-versus. I'm sorry, say it again. So the, so the was there a question? Oh, so the, so the spectrum stems from a non versus approach, from a unifying approach, which means instead of ideas being separate and scattered in education, they all have a place, they're unified in terms of a larger schema, a larger theory. So we don't, we don't have things that are good ideas out here, but where does it fit in the structure and the theory of pedagogy? The same thing with inconsistent terminology. One of the things about the spectrum is that it has consistent terminology throughout the styles. Now, these three questions, these three conclusions about the foundation for the, the philosophical perspective of the spectrum did not answer the last question. What differentiates one teaching style from another? That, <clears throat> excuse me, that question was eventually, that question was eventually answered when Muska discovered, what is it that all teachers do at all times? Slide two. If we go back to our framework, we see the number one, the axiom. And it says teaching is a chain of decision making. Muska discovered that every act of teaching, every act is, is, follow, is because of a chain of decision making and once he had that axiom then he had the task of identifying number two the anatomy of any style and that I'm, I'm, I'm pointing I don't know that you can see it or not but the anatomy the pre-impact impact and post impact those three decisions that's critical what he identified was what is the set of decisions that teachers always make, no matter what teaching style, no matter what age, no, what subject matter? And he listed these, cate these categories of decisions. And then he, he saw that certain decisions had a commonality. Certain decisions dealt with the preparation and the planning, pre-impact. Certain decisions dealt with the impact, the implementation of those pre-impact decisions and some decisions dealt with assessment. This is, this is not before class, in class, and out of class. These are the sets of decisions. This, this is like your skeletal system. The anatomy is your skeletal system. Now, the next question that he had to ask after he had these decisions was, who are the decision makers? You can have a teacher or you can have a learner. And depending on which, depending on how many decisions, depending on how many decisions the teacher makes, then the learners going to no. If the teacher makes maximum decisions in all of those anatomy in that skeletal system, 
then they have a relationship that we call the command style. And this is the way Muska developed this, the spectrum, by identifying if the teacher and the learner have a certain specific set of decisions that they each make, what are the, what are the, what's, the what, what's gonna happen in terms of learning? <clears throat> so the first style on the spectrum is the command style. And I know you're familiar with the command style. So the command style is literally the teacher making maximum decisions and the learners making minimal. It is not a good style, a bad style. It is. It is a relationship that, can, that people can have. Then the next thing he had to do after he had identified, oh wait, one other thing. Because every teaching style not only stops with just its teaching behavior, it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's teaching style. But you can look at the spectrum, the range on, on the spectrum of the styles and see that they are divided by a cognitive clusters. Style A through E all deal with memory development. Now, memory is not just one word, memory, memorizing. There's a whole cluster of cognitive operations that deal with memory. So styles A, B, C, and D deal with any activity, with any kind of thinking where there is memory involved. And each of these different teaching styles have a different form of remembering. They practice in a different way. And once we get to the style E, by the way, these styles have names, okay? Are you familiar with it? Okay. Um, once we get to style F, the styles on the right-hand side, they all deal with discovery, cognitive operations. So whenever you have a, dis and again, discovery is not one pattern. There are multiple patterns of discovery. Style F, guided discovery, is a particular structure that leads cognitive thinking in a particular path, which is different from style G, H, I, and J. So the question is, what is it that a teacher wants to teach their learners? How does a teacher want learners to learn? And then we have the various teaching styles that are going to accommodate that learning focus that the teacher has. Now, every teaching style not only has its cognitive clustering, but it also has its developmental effects. It's why we, it's why we teach, we wanna develop. And we can develop people in multiple ways, on multiple channels of development. The physical, the social, the emotional, the cognitive, the sexual, the mindfulness, and technology. And there's one other one that's not added here, which is the financial. Now, if you notice on this chart, the developmental effects are single. I've, I've listed, there's a space between mindfulness and technology. And financial should be there. The reason for that is that physical through mindfulness are all internal, uh, sexual, it stops at sexuality, are all internal developmental patterns that occur whether we like it or not. We grow as people physically. We grow as people emotionally. We don't need a teacher to teach us or a parent to, to teach us that. We grow. Now, do we need their guidance? Of course. But these are internal mechanisms that happen to human beings as they grow. They can get nourishment from other outside sources or they can get or they can be hindered by outside sources. But all of us grow in these areas. Technology and finances are external. But because of the importance of technology and the financial world, these are two developmental these are two channels that influence human growth and development. And technology is going to, unfortunately, impact every one of our other channels of development in the future significantly. Lots of concerns about the way technology is shit. I mean, if you think about it, how has it changed physical, physical practicing technology? How has it changed our social socializing? Technology has altered the way we deal with our sexuality and the way we deal with these, with our mind, with all of these channels of development. 
And each and every one of these styles, we can arrange and design lesson plans to accommodate development in these different areas, in the styles and in the de developmental channels. Um, any questions so far? I, I need to hear from you. Go ahead. I have a small little question. May I? Go ahead, please. Yeah. So uh, is it like uh, one particular lesson will have just one aspect from the developmental channels or the cognitive cluster? Or will it be a combination of uh, the channels or clusters, aspects? Actually, at every moment, all channels are functioning on minimal or maximum levels. Like, take right now. Physically, we are all in some place. We're not active. We're, we're sedentary. We're stationary. Socially, you're at minimum. Emotionally, you're, you're wherever you are. Um, cognitively, you have either allowed yourself to engage in, 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 in the content and take you someplace, or else you're thinking about your grocery list. But every one of us on each and every one of these channels, these channels are always functioning on some kind of a level. It may be insignificant in terms of, uh, uh, of, of trying, of development, but there's, we, are, we can never not be in any of these. But we do design our lesson plans to accommodate our development on, on these different channels of development. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Understood. Anything else? Anybody, please. Understood. All right, let's see. Thank you. All right, so let's go to the website. <laughs> I'm moving on to the, to the website now. On the website, I wanted to introduce you to the website. Let's go to the spectrum. Let's go to About Us. We'll do the map. This is just a side note, just so that you know you are not alone in your study of the spectrum. This is a very incomplete map of, of people who have downloaded our spectrum book. We are currently in 96 different countries of where people have downloaded our book, and we're almost at 5,000 downloads in the last year. So we're very, very excited about the spread of the spectrum. Why do you think the spectrum has been in this educational arena for 52 years? That's a question. Why do you think the spectrum has been? Okay. Uh, may I? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think uh, because the spectrum doesn't uh, limit itself to one particular subject, this is number one. And uh, it also caters to um, all the learning needs uh, of the learners. And I think uh, if, it, if it's understood well, the teachers can really uh, you know, achieve the learning outcomes. That's what uh, I have experienced and I, that's what I feel. The teacher can what? Say it again. Uh, they can achieve the l outcomes that they have planned. Exactly. Through, uh, spectrum. Exactly. There is a great there is great congruence between the intent that we have in, in pedagogy and the action because of the spectrum. That there's high correlation that can occur because of the specificity of the decisions and the fact that each of the teaching styles is a, is a particular philosophy of teaching. And then we move to the next one. So that every idea out there in pedagogy fits somewhere within the spectrum. It's an, it's an all-inclusive 
unifying theory that is universal as we look at this map. It's very impressive and very humbling to me to look at this and to see the number of countries who have said yes to the same idea. Now, one of the things that we, Muska and I, believed could alter education completely is if we had a unified theory that all teachers held on to. Not that that would limit what we do in pedagogy, but it could expand it because we have a common base from which our ideas come from. It's like going to space. Every astronaut doesn't have their own vision of aerodynamics. There's rules and laws and principles and procedures that you have to follow in order to go into space. And everybody follows them. But in education, that's not true. We have idiosyncratic um, philosophies of what pedagogy is. Therefore, we, can't, we don't have consistency or unity among what we do. And nor do we have agreement when we talk to our colleagues and, and to our teachers. Supervision is very difficult for, for teachers because one year they're, they're, the, the philosophy is this and the next year it's this. What would happen if we had a structure that was solid and consistent and that we could layer things onto it rather than the verses? Throw out what you've been doing and now let's do this. Besides that, we as a nation, as nations, we're going to go broke if we continue to do that. The amount of money that it costs to every three or five years change our curriculum is ridiculous. If we have a common understanding, a common core of what pedagogy is, and then we build upon it, and when new ideas come, we know where to place them within the, within the structure. Now, is it, is it difficult in the beginning to learn a different way to think? Yes, in the beginning it is. It's awkward because we're not used to thinking that way. But if musicians can do it, we can do it. Why do I say musicians? Because musicians are guided by a congruency within their understanding of the notes. Every musician adheres to the notes, regardless of their personality, regardless of what instrument they're teaching, and regardless of the kind of music they're playing. Musicians adhere to the notes. When new ideas come along, we know which category to put them in. So why can't we do that same thing with pedagogy? Let new ideas come in, but let's have a place from which we can understand them. Now, let me, before I go on, back to the website. Um, theory. Now, have you all had a chance to look at the website a little bit? Okay. Some of us have. Okay. Well, then I'm going to introduce you to the website. The first thing that we have here is the overview of the framework. Scroll down. I don't think there's anything else there. Okay. Here, uh, up a little bit more. On this one, they do have the financial. All right. Okay, so here's your overview. This is, this is what we would love for teachers to be able to do because if, if teachers can learn, a, if teachers can develop a repertoire of teaching, think, how, think of all the learning experiences that our students could have and the variety. We don't want every kid in our school to only be able to do the command style or the reciprocal style. We want them to be able to have mobility ability so that whatever their natural tendencies and desires are can be developed and so that their deficiencies can be, can be supplemented. We want to develop learners. In fact, I was gonna ask you the question, um, which is, and I ask this of every one of my undergraduate students when they first come to class, Define teaching. Think now. You define teaching for yourself. Write it down. I, use, I have a collection of these. If you'd like, you can put it in the chat. No, so well, we can see it. 
No, I don't want to. So, so in your head, do you have your definition? Now, when I ask my undergraduate students, they almost 95%, they almost 95 of the time say this. Sorry, one moment. Okay. 95% of the time when I ask my students to define teaching, their answer will be to transfer information. It's almost unanimous. Transfer information. Do you have a question? Not a question. Do you have a question? No, not a question. I was thinking uh, uh, teaching is the professional act as defined in as what? I didn't talk book or some of the books. Um, it's the uh, act of the teachers. It's the professional act done by the teachers to help. Yeah. Teaching is the professional act that done by teachers to help the learners uh, to learn. Okay. Yes. The way we've now defined it is that teaching is a process that results in development. Um, someone did put in the chat, teaching is exploring the innate. Teaching is exploring the innate, someone stated. Yes, but what is, the, but that's not visibly Account, we can't be visibly accountable to that definition. The question that the statement that we finally came up with is again, what is it that all teachers do? What is it that teaching it? No, not all teachers. What is it that all that that all teaching does? The act of teaching. What what does it do? And it's a process that results in development. What development that? that increases that increases cognition that expands content that um, I, I don't have this in front of me that do you have the definition of teaching not in front of me no it's slide what it's slide 18 one moment I will pull that up I think it's important that we know this definition because it guides everything we do. Teaching is a process that results in development. Development that triggers cognition, that engages content, that emphasizes human attributes on the various developmental channels, and promotes decision making. All teachers, no matter what they're teaching, no matter the age and the content, all teachers need to do this and if they do this, we have learning that, that can result. And instead of having definitions that are, that are philosophical, we need teachers who, and supervisors who are able to look at the act of teaching and have a common point of departure. Now this means, if this is indeed a possible definition, one of the most important things that the colleges need to begin with is to teach students to understand the broadest process of thinking. Thinking from command to discovery. Whoops. It's okay, just keep going. Thinking from command to discovery. The cognition, the understanding of cognition and the development of cognition is critical to development. We can't have development without it. And if teachers can be able to talk about different cognitive operations and how to frame their questions and how to excite their learners and how to develop them. It could be really, really, it's really exciting. We also want teachers to know their content. They have to know their content in order to develop learning. And then they emphasize the attributes on the, on the various channels of development. Now the channels of development are oftentimes misunderstood 
the, the word attributes is critical. A attributes are all of the, the, all of the personal characteristics that human beings have, from kindness to viciousness, from loyalty to dishonor, from courage and sweetness and thoughtfulness and whatever the word may be that describes a person, those are attributes. And those attributes are, are in every teaching episode that we do. They're in every moment of our lives. Every time we help someone open a door, we're doing a kind act. We're doing, we, we can place the action in terms of how it is an attribute to humanity. And one of the things we need to do with our learners is to get them to be able to be aware of the multiple attributes and how those attributes shape who we are as human beings. Every teaching style relies on different sets of attributes. And that's why there's human development along with content development in each of the spectrum styles. You have in each of the spectrum styles its own kind of cognitive development its own engagement in the subject matter development, its own human development, and once, and then of course, in order to do those things, you have to promote a decision making. Decision making is how you do what you do, and how you do what you do is represented differently in each of the styles. How you learn in style A is very different from how you learn in style H. So we want to introduce students to these different ways of learning. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's our job. And if we had teachers and administrators and if our textbooks could approach teaching from a common understanding, we would have teachers who were able to talk to each other and to develop things in a more system, systemic way. Does this definition make any sense to you? Any questions? Um, I do want to interrupt for a moment. We had some excellent notes in the chat. Uh, they were popping up as you were giving the definition. Okay. Um, so one person said, Under teaching is understanding the next immediate need. Another one said, teaching is connecting with people's minds. Okay, hold it right there. The, the person that said connecting with teacher's, teacher's mind. Pupils' minds. You're, you're dealing with, you want triggering cognition. But triggering cognition is not the only thing we want to do. We need a definition that's going to develop the entire person. Their thinking, their content, their humanness, and their decision-making capacity. Go ahead, what's the next one? Um, another person said, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm not saying names. I, I'm afraid I will mispronounce it and I don't wanna do that to you. Um, so the next person said, it is a process to make something understood. Yes, it is, but un what understood? The cognition, the content, the humanity, or the, dis or the decision, or the decisions. So what I'm trying to, you're absolutely correct. However, if we're going to have specificity or if we're going to have accountability, we need specificity. So if we can get teachers to talk more exactly in terms of what all, you see, you can't, teachers can't just do one of these. Teachers have to do all of these. Educators, that's what our job is. If you notice at the bottom, it says, Professional teacher's definition. It is a deliberate process because everything, everything is teaching. Everybody teaches from the moment we're born until the moment we die. We are always in a position of teaching or of learning. But not everyone is a professional teacher. And a professional teacher is one who deliberately, who engages in a deliberate process to develop. And we know which cognitive aspects we're developing in each lesson, and how we want learners to engage in the content, and how we want them to express their humanness, and then how they make decisions. I'm sorry to interrupt again. Mm -hmm. 
Dennis has a question. Please. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Dennis. My question is, uh, or I have to say that uh, uh, as a teacher, I'm also um, responsible for the development of skills so that a child, since I'm dealing with a child, uh, tomorrow is able to have or build skills which are able to contribute to the welfare of the nation. I could not quite hear the end of that. Could you say it a little louder? Or closer to your microphone, please. Oh, up here. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can you repeat it, Dennis? Sure. Is that better? Well, that is much better, yes. So as a teacher, I'm also uh, supposed to develop a child so that tomorrow when they, uh, they are old enough, they are able to contribute to the, to the Indian economy or the development of the nation. That's, that's, see if you want, you're saying that you're, you're as a teacher, you're responsible for educating the child to contribute to the development of the nation. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, considering the new uh, policies that we have. Yes. So the question is, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. Sharika, Sharada, can you help? Can you say it? Your voice is a little louder. Can you repeat his statement? Yes. Um, uh, Dennis uh, say, wants to say that as a teacher, we are responsible for the development of the child in such a way that the child is able to contribute when he, uh, when the child grows up, he's able to contribute to the growth of the nation in terms of uh, economy, I suppose. So. Uh, that's it. Absolutely, Dennis, I agree with you 100%. Contributing to the nation, how can they contribute to the nation? They contribute, can contribute because they have the capacity to think in a variety of ways. They're versatile in their thinking. They can help a, a, a society because they know content, not superficially, but they know content. And they can inf and they they understand humanity. If you understand the attributes, look at all of the problems that we're having in the United States. I'll just pick our nation. We're having a spree of killings and shootings. All of these are behaviors that represent different attributes, negative attributes. We need to talk more about positive attributes and various attributes in our classrooms. We do not talk deliberately enough about attributes and how they represent who we are and the way we feel about other people. And teaching children to be able to make decisions is critical for contributing to a society. If students can't learn to make decisions, they're gonna be a burden to the society. Look at the homeless. The homeless are unable or unwilling if they're unwilling, then it's a human attribute. If they're unable, it's because of a, maybe a physical condition or a mental condition. So we have to be able to know how to, how to help a society. And no matter what our conclusions are for helping, it's going to fit within these four categories. But you're right, we are responsible for the next generation but we have to know how, how to develop them and teaching them about cognition and about content, about attributes and about decision-making to teach them about mobility, ability of the different teaching styles is absolutely critical, critical. Next, where are we? I'm sorry to interrupt again. We had another question. Oh, what please. do you do to change unwilling individuals? I wish I knew the answer to that. I'll give you my answer based on experience. The only way you can change is if a person wants to or if a person feels that they have no other choice. In a school, 
there's an expression that says, the fish stinks first from the head. Principals, assistants, people who are in the administrative position have to know this information. They have to understand development of not only the child, but the development of the teachers that they work with. And if the right reward system is there and the right reprimand system is in place, they'll have a better chance of changing behavior. I don't know, in the United States, we have a real problem with the unions. Our unions control the class, classroom teacher's behavior a little more than we would like. And sometimes they protect incompetence. We have to remove the protection and we have to increase the process of dignified training. We need dignified training in order to get teachers to change. Also, if you have the majority of the teachers who are doing the spectrum, then you have a better chance of having more people say yes to the, to the process. That is a challenge. And uh, the same person who gave the question said it's a global issue, um, which I'm sure you would agree with. Absolutely. Teaching is a global issue. Um, yes. What else? And I have a question. Okay. Can I? Please. Okay. Uh, is there any relation between the Asian experience and the teaching style one is going to teach? Can you, can you? Rada, can you repeat? Between the age and experience, uh, you're breaking up. We're only hearing every second word. Can I, I repeat? Is there any relation between? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat it? Because there's a there's a yes, ma'am. Uh, he wants to say, is there any relation between the age and experience of the teacher and the students and, and the teaching styles, the use of teaching styles? Absolutely not. There is no relationship between age and the ability to teach the teaching style. What is, what is the very wrong is a teacher's ability to be, is the teacher's willingness to 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 the definition of teaching they're 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 wanting to the desire that's what i'm trying to say the desire is the desire to improve to be good to expand the learner if the focus isn't on the learner and the teacher is not taking the responsibility of creating appropriate lessons then that's the variable that counts but age is and it can be kindergarten teachers, or it can be college teachers. It can be, there's no relationship whatsoever. Uh, they didn't say age. They said Asian experience. Asian? Yeah, Asian experience. Or not, maybe they did say age and experience. No, both Asian and experience of the teacher. Experience. No, it's, there, there's no relationship. Anybody can do the spectrum. You know, the more, uh, you know, we did find this. Oftentimes, the more a teacher said that they were a creative teacher, I teach creatively. I am a wonderful creative teacher. Oh, I just do great things. And then when they study the spectrum, they find out that the decision relationship in the classroom is not creative, that it represents memory. And that crushes them and they want nothing to do with the spectrum because they know they're creative and the spectrum said they're not so it's 
teachers who are able to see who they are against the theory that can develop them. Those are the teachers that do well. The ability to accept growth and development is a major variable in terms of teachers doing the spectrum. Um, someone in the chat said, I don't think so. You need to be innovative and creative all the time while teaching. Absolutely. There is no, I did not say don't be creative. Creative is, is, is the spice of life. It's what motivates and develops our society. Talking about the contributing to the society, our creative acts keep us moving forward as a society. We need creativity. What we don't need are teachers who say they are being creative when they are not. So the more we can have congruence between what we say we're doing and what we do, that's when we have results. I agree with you. Creative. One more question. Uh, are the kind of learning styles uh, is related with the teaching styles? Again, your, your microphone is breaking up. Sharada, can you repeat? Or, or type it in the chat. Huh? I said, or he could put it in the chat and I'll read it out to you. Whichever. Are learning styles related to teaching? <laughs> Auditor. Audio, audio tree, kinesthetic, kinesthetic. So auditory, kinesthetic, this, those styles. Those styles. Forgive me for my comments, but it's after fifty-two years of working with the spectrum. Those things that you just mentioned can apply to any teaching style. Go back to the uh, framework number two. Any of the teaching styles can be done in any of those learning styles that you mentioned. You can do kinesthetic, auditory, whatever, in any style. They are not representative of a discrete learning behavior. They are more preferences. Do you prefer to, to work on the floor or in a chair? That has nothing to do with learning content, behavior, attributes. It's a preference. In fact, each and every one of the teaching styles has its own learning experience. In fact, that's, the major, that's one of the major questions that teachers have to ask themselves. How do I want my learners to learn? Do I want them to learn a la style A? Or do I want them to learn a la style D? Because each teaching style develops people in certain ways, and we want that development to translate into learning. Shrada so, put, oh. put a very interesting question. How does a teacher relinquish personal attributes such as type A personality while using spectrum? Ah. You have, you have one, they have to know what the next behavior, another behavior would look like. So the more they can see videos of the different teaching styles, the more they can see the structure that, is, that they have to learn, the more they can practice the different teaching styles on a micro level. We, do, we call it micro teaching. Practice with one or two or three or five kids get the behaviors down so the teacher feels comfortable with this new behavior. And then you move it more and more into the classroom. You know, practice with feedback does make perfect. And we need teachers who are able to receive non-judgmental, encouraging feedback. And the reasons for the reasons for knowing the various teaching styles, you know, this name any, well, I'll get to that later, but in terms of learning styles, every one of these different teaching styles has its own way of learning. 
that help? Sharada, does that help? Okay. Swanand, did that answer your question? Swanand? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. okay. So actually, uh, that brings me to another question actually. So if I have uh, 20 kids, and if 10 of them are auditory learners, and 10 are kinesthetic. I, I can't hear it. He said oh. he has 20 students, and 10 hmm. of them are auditory learners, and 10 of them are kinesthetic. Depending on that, can I select a specific teaching style? Can, I, he, can he use that information, the fact that 10 of them are auditory learners and 10 of them are kinesthetic learners, to choose a teaching style? Absolutely. But you can, what you can do is you can, you, can do, you can do a teaching style with both of those. You don't have to have one teaching style for one and one teaching style for the other. Because those learning styles that you mentioned, they are not style specific. They can apply to all the styles. You can have one group of kids in the class who are doing auditory and another group who's doing something else. You can have them in different clusters. Yes. Let's, let's move on to, do you know what the different styles look like? Well, let's take a look at them. Go back to the, to the menu line on the website. Hello. Uh, one moment. Okay. We have the theory. Up at, and you want to go to the landmark styles. Right. All right. Now wait, go 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 down a little bit. The definite the blue part. The blue. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, on top. Okay, right there. If you notice the definition of of uh, of, a, of, a, of teaching is partially mentioned here. That teaching is a process that results in development. Development that triggers cognition, engages content, highlights different attributes on the developmental channels, and promotes decision making. That's our definition of teaching. Now, as we look at the various teaching styles, scroll down, each of these different teaching styles promote those, those points differently. Let's do style A. I know you're familiar with the command style, but let's take a look at it. Go to the diving one first. Now, actually, actually, go, go. If you notice uh, about, yeah, go down to the anatomy. This, Command style has a particular anatomy where the teacher makes all decisions and the learner is to follow and to do as they are told. Now, from this relationship, there are certain objectives in the subject matter that they are exposed to. So whenever we want to expose our learners or to develop our learners in any of these at, um, objectives, we select the command style. Not only do we always develop subject matter objectives, but go down, but we also develop behavioral objectives. So these are partial objectives in subject matter and behavior that we are trying to develop when we do the command style. Now, is there what's below? Okay, go back up to the pictures. Now, what would a what would a classroom episode look like? in the command style. The diving example, precision performance. Go ahead, just kind of, I'm gonna have her scroll through. Every one of these are precision performance. Every person in the group is doing, oh, hold on, yes, yeah, do that one. Watch this, this is cool. Give me just a moment, I'm going to get to. It, it can be really anywhere. I think that's pretty cool. It's an example of the command style 
one of the major objectives or reasons for using the command style is safety. Each of these examples have different, go ahead, go faster, faster. These are sports that represent the command style. In our society, we have so many areas, the performing arts, all of these are examples of our society that uses, that relies on the command style, our recreational activities. There's so many experiences, yet in education, and, oh, hold, hold, well, it's hard. Why do you think that the military uses the command style as their major image? Because it represents strength, unity, togetherness, power. So, so many different areas in our society. Go ahead. And then we have culture and tradition. Um, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Some of them want to ask questions after the presentation. Is that okay? Sure, of course. And then someone said that the military uses command style A for precision and because error causes death. Exactly, exactly. And that's also true of the parachuting one that they, what we just saw. So whenever any of these objectives are the focus of the learning experience, we use the command style. And it could be a two minute episode or it could be a several hour episode. But the command style is one possible way of learning. So there's a relationship between what the teacher does and what the learner and how the learner learns. Let's go on to the next style. Style B. If the commands, if the anatomy, of, if the anatomy in the command style was TTT, we have to shift decisions. And Muska found that the place for shift, where we would have a, a significant difference, but a style that was akin to the command style was in the impact set. Nine decisions are shifted to the learner in the impact set. We're deliberately developing specific decision-making capacities with the spectrum. And we tell them, today when we do what we're going to do, you're gonna make certain decisions, and they are. Many, many learners do not know how to make these decisions appropriately. So we practice while they're doing the content. This is not, we're gonna spend time doing, doing um, character, character building activities, and then we're gonna do content. No, with the spectrum, you are always doing both. You are relating to the students what you're doing in content and how you are to behave as in, in, in attributes. <clears throat> the purpose of, of the practice style is to have a learner practice individually and privately and to have the teacher circulate and offer individual and private feedback to, his, to the students. So it's a very common experience. It is probably one of the most used teaching styles on the entire spectrum. It's necessary. We have, we, people need the experts to come in to give us feedback on certain tasks. And this is one way of doing that. Go ahead. Just slide through. It doesn't matter what the activity is. You see the child is practicing individually and privately, and the teacher comes and offers individual and private feedback. Keep going. And it, young or old, it doesn't matter. Activities, fun activities or serious stuff. And our, our babies, what we do is we try to slowly get them to be able to make these decisions. It's a progression. So style B, look at the number of governmental agencies that have um, supervisors who inspect everything from your meat to your vegetables to the road quality. There's always, there are always avenues, there are always positions where people are assigned to do something and then there is a supervisor. And that represents the command, I mean, the, the practice style. 
Um, Shraddha put in the chat, most of our pre-service teachers use practice style and reciprocal style in their practice teaching lessons. And she didn't write anything else. 98% of all teachers in all countries use the practice style. No matter what they say they are doing, no matter what philosophy they say they're following, 90% of the time we have seen that the practice style is the most predominant teaching style. So you know the practice style. So let's not deal with it. Let's, let's go on to... Did you want to talk about the subject matter objectives and behavior objectives or move on to style C? Well, just to note that in this new decision relationship, we have new developmental intents. And these objectives are now the new, the new focus of the learning in subject matter and behavior. All of the objectives that you will read have aspects in it that we want our students for, to develop so that they can contribute to the next generation. If we don't deliberately try to develop these objectives in each of the styles, we'll have deficiencies in the development of our, of our next generation. Okay, next one. And then right before I move on, um, she said, I feel it's easy for them to manage their classes because of the large class size. And then she asked, can one lesson include different styles? Absolutely. You can have, if you have a 45 minute class or an eight hour class, it doesn't matter. You can segment it. You can segment it. By, oh, can you go to, can you go to number eight? Yes. One moment, please. Okay. If you look at the top part, you can segment your classes. They are already segmented. You have episodes. You have a period of time in which the teacher and the learner are in the same style. You have one segment where you teach a certain way, and then you have new objectives, and you have a different experience and a different experience. The, the top part of this, of, these, of this episodic teaching diagram shows that in the classroom, there are indeed, this is what I'm trying to say, it shows in the classroom that there are indeed different episodes that occur in the classroom. However, the objectives that are trying to be met in those experiences are the same. That represents what is happening in the classroom today. 95% of what goes on in the classroom is style B objectives. That's, it's a given. We are, we are suggesting that teachers can have multiple episodes. If they knew the different teaching styles, they could change their behavior. And they could have different experiences. So you have, in the second diagram, you have different segments, different periods of time in which the teacher and the learner are engaged. However, they're engaged in different teaching styles. So that's one. This, by the way, is going to be the future of teaching. We've got to move to episodic teaching. Now there's another way of also expanding this to make it even more complicated and it, or more intriguing is within that period of time, you have certain tasks that are in one episode, one teaching style, and another task that's in a different teaching style. So multiple tasks, you can have 30, 40 kids in the classroom and 10 of them are doing style B and 10 of them are doing style C and five of them are doing style H. You could have it in multiple, multiple arrangements. But if you don't know how to structure different teachings and learning styles, you can't have a variety of learning experiences. Okay? So All right. I hate to interrupt again, but we have about 20 minutes left. I don't know how much time we would like to set aside for questions. I would like first to go to, I would like to go to, PowerPoint six. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to. 
I'm going to jump. Um, I don't like the layout of this chart. It is also in the textbook on page 105. If you give me a moment, I can pull that up. Oh, all right. Okay, on page one, on page 85 in the textbook, 84, is it's this 84 chart. 84 in the print book, but it is 105 on the digital copy of the book. Right. This is a very important chart for those of you who are trying to get students to learn the spectrum. This is an overview of a, of a lesson. Every lesson has expectations. It has expectations in terms of subject matter, behavior, and logistics. These three categories are delivered separately, and they are the essence of the, of the lesson. You identify, oh, by the way, and they can be in any order, in any sequence. And this is a shorthand of what the learner is going to do. This is when teachers, when students are experienced, they jot down very quickly what, what, what the expectations are, what the content, what the focus of learning is going to be. But every lesson has a structure to it. And it is that they are three expectations, then the questions for clarification, and then you move the students into action, into doing the task, and feedback is offered, and then there's closure. This, in essence, is, is a class. Now let's go to the next one, which is the lesson plan, which is 20, I don't know, 226. Let me double check that. Yeah. This one? Yes. Now this one is the detailed. Whenever my students had to videotape, and they had to videotape each and every, micro-teach every one of the episodes, every one of the teaching styles. In this, in this form, students would have to identify the episode number, and then, and again, the order of the categories can, can change. You can have objective first or subject matter topic first. But every student had to identify what is the specific content? What is it that I'm gonna say? What is, why am I doing what I'm doing? The, the teaching and learning behavior, which style are you gonna use? And what are the logistics and the parameters? How much time for that episode? And then comments on, on later. And then each of the activities that a teacher was going to do in a lesson had to be literally written down so that they could practice it. It's the way we learn, by practicing. And this form made them rehearse what it is that they were going to do in the classroom to create their learning experiences. Now they may have this, there may be 20 pieces of paper once they write down everything. Episode one could be a lot of writing. Episode two could be a little. But that is the structure that was used for, for lesson plans. And it, it has worked brilliantly. So I offer it to you for your consideration. Now, now, if you look at this and you go back to the episodic teaching under teacher and learner behavior, you could have A for one. You could have C for another. You could have H for one. So depending how you want the learners to learn, that content determines the teaching style that you're going to use. And because the teaching style is so precise in terms of its decision structure, you're able to assess whether or not there was congruence between your intent and your action. Questions? We did have a question from a minute ago. 
Okay. What are the elements, variables, and factors to take into consideration when deciding a style or styles? And then there was a second question, but I'll let you answer that one first. What, what are the considerations for selecting style? One, yeah. the first consideration is, where is the learner? What is it that the learner what is what is familiar to the learner not not that you want to keep the learner in their point of familiarness but you want to start off with success in terms of familiarity and then you want to move on to another style that will expand their decision making capacity that will expand their cognitive engagement that will expand their their learning so one consideration is where is the learner? Another consideration is, is the content. Major consideration is, is what, what would best fit the content um, consideration for making a selection. Um, another one would be any of the developmental channel factors. Emotionally, can they handle it? Um, but the main thing is you start with where they can be successful and then you move them forward. Now, if we use the previous diagram. The one on page 205? Yes. If. Oh, that's not. Now, now, see, this is an example of a task sheet. And well, and if you look up here, it's style E. This represents the style that this practice sheet elicits. So style E is the slanty rope style. Brilliant style. You want to have inclusion in your classroom? Do the slanty rope. You're familiar with the with inclusion. It's Instead of one standard in, this, in the task, there's multiple standards for the slanty rope. And you have different levels that the student can choose their, their level of performance. But I know that's not what I wanted to show you. Yeah, I'm looking for the other page. That was, I think it was 105. It's 105, ma'am. There we go. Thank you so much. Using, using this form, Let's look at swimming. Let's look at the example. Let's look at a classroom and see how this information fits style C. You're familiar with style C? I don't think we're going to have enough time to go through it. And we do have some questions in the chat. OK, I really need to. All right. I'm so sorry. We have about 10 minutes left. Yikes, yikes, yikes. Go ahead. Okay. We have, how do you get out of the mindset of style A? And that was from Sherrod. And I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing things. Names. You experience other styles. You do episodes in the other styles. You know, style A is not a bad style. Style A is really a, a wonderful, can be a wonderful, stimulating experience. If the cognition is challenging, if the attributes are intriguing, and the, and, and the students are able to perform the task, it, style A is incredible. Look at all the examples that we had in our society. So one, we need to legitimize the use of, of the command style, but we need to honor the idea of development. If teachers understood that, te that, that teaching is about development, then they cannot stand on the platform that I want to do what I want to do. No, you have to do what is defined as development. And that's the variety of teaching styles, the variety of objectives in subject matter and behavior. Teachers cannot, unless there's serious issues with a learner, you cannot stay in the same teaching style in a, in a child's career. You must move it forward. Schools ought to have 
select teachers by which teaching styles they're comfortable doing and they're capable of doing so that children throughout their experience can have a variety of experiences and opportunities to develop. You cannot allow a teacher to just use one teaching style, no matter what it is. But back to the question, you can get out of the mindset of style A by looking into and watching episodes of other styles. Absolutely. Um, we had, Shrada said, I feel the spectrum is meant for every educational level. I yes. want to understand it and how we use it in our teacher education program. We have a typical lecture approach. Right. You need, you need video um, tape, micro video tape examples of the different styles. Very quickly put on swimming. Okay. We'll, we'll do two seconds of it. You know, one of the things that the Center on Teaching is that the Spectrum Institute is going to be doing is making videotapes. I want to very quickly show you this because I don't know how you were interpreting the reciprocal style. But the reciprocal style is a social style. It teaches attributes and, and cognition and that, that surround socialization and improvement of content. If you want your learners to improve content, Use the reciprocal style. Use the, the uh, inclusion style. Two powerful styles for improvement of, of uh, content. Go ahead. Let's look at what a, an episode... Will the following like. video tapes an example of a landmark reciprocal style C teaching episode. This teaching style is new to the learners. Therefore, the teacher provides a complete explanation of the style's expectations. Good morning, class. If you all recall, last class, I had the opportunity to introduce you to the breaststroke. After watching everybody, and it's your first time going through the breaststroke, I realized we need a lot more practice. So I want to introduce you, everybody, to a really powerful teaching style called reciprocal style. So I need help today. I need to have each and every one of you assist me in that role of being the teacher. And reciprocal style teaching works out brilliantly. So what's going to happen with this style, everybody, is I'm going to have a doer and I'm going to have an observer. The doer is actually going to get into the water and you're going to practice your breaststroke. All three doing the pull, breathe, kick, and then glide. The observer, your role in this is you are going to help the doer by using a criteria sheet. And it's going to be your role today as the teacher to provide feedback to the doer who is performing. So the observer, it's going to be your role that you are going to look at all the critical components of the breaststroke and you are going to watch your partner. And that's why they call it reciprocal style. So I want you to look at this and you will check off if that aspect of the stroke is evident or if it's not evident. During that time, I want all of you to provide as much feedback as you possibly can so your partner can perform the breaststroke more proficiently. All right, that's going to be your role. So you're going to be helping me out as a teacher guiding your partner. Then at the end of that, I'm going to give you time to share with your partner what they did correctly and what are the areas that they still need to work on so they can become more proficient. So reciprocal means we're going to change places. The doer now is now going to become the observer. The observer is now going to become the doer. Now what I'd like each and every one of you to do is I'd like you to find a partner that you would like to work with. Find a partner and stand next to that person, please. Fantastic. Sarah, you're muted. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm showing you this is so that you can see when you are introducing a new teaching style, it's a longer, it takes more time. You have to explain what it is that, and the reasons for why it is that you're doing what you're doing. If you notice, they've now started by picking their own partner. Sometimes the teacher may need to do that. But at any rate, for here, 
we want the learners to be able to pick their own partner. Um, is, is this a familiar? Okay, go ahead. I did want to say, someone said, are if knowing a style in theory and practicing it with 100% in practice are two different things? If yes, how to fill in the gap between same? Feedback. If I understand the question, it was, if there's what? Um, um, how do you fill the gap between knowing it in theory and practicing it with 100%? Videotape. There's nothing like videotaping. Micro teaching, it doesn't need to be a, an hour session. 15 minutes for style A, it was three minutes. It was style B, 10 minutes. Style C, 15 minutes. You do it, you do it, and you watch the video, you watch the video. Videotaping is done by everybody but classroom teachers. We need classroom teachers to view themselves so that they can see whether or not they're developing cognition, whether or not they're expanding their content to, and, and focusing attributes and, and promoting decisions. And if you can't see those things happening in the videotape, they do a retape. They do it over again. Now, let's watch to see what the um, recipient looks like. Sorry. The, how can there be only one correct answer to a question in style G? And then Strata had another question after that. Oh, that's easy. Okay, let's let's look at the rest of this very quickly. Good. Now, as you're standing there right now, could you please talk and ask who would be the doer and who's going to be the observer? I'm going to ask you to take a spot in the pool from these red flags moving up all the way up to the ladder. You have to find your own personal spot and we are going to be swimming the doer with wise with your partner who is going to be the observer and they are going to be right in front of you so they can see every aspect of your stroke along with the critical cues that are on the criteria sheet. You won't become as tired if you keep your feet inverted the way Ann said, and your, your streamline will last. If you do that with your feet, your glide will go longer and get yeah. easier. Your glide phase, that's your relaxing phase. So when you come back, you have all that force again to start over. All right, we don't have time to show any more than that, but I think it gives you an idea of, this, of, the, of the, the way in which you implement the reciprocal style and all of the styles. You start off with such a matter of behavior and logistics. You explain to the learners what it is that they are to do and how they are to do it. Okay. And then Sharada said, please throw a light on the canopy. Um, can you go to that slide? I hope we, will we be cut off if we go beyond our? No, we shouldn't. In the, in the um, website under Canopy is, will be the same thing that I am going to show you now. No, the, no, that's not it, that's the blank one, 11. Oh, right, sorry. Uh, so this is another video. A new insight. Some researchers and teachers hold the belief that the spectrum is a theory about 11 landmark teaching styles. They often say, I'm not doing spectrum today. Now this thinking is inconsistent with the very philosophical foundation of a unified theory. The landmark styles are unique learning milestones. They each have a specific decision structure with a corresponding set of objectives. However, in between these milestones exists an infinite array of teaching possibilities called canopies. The canopies are not landmark styles. Canopies have a similar but slightly different decision structure and set of objectives than the landmark styles. However, these canopies, or teaching possibilities, are necessary for learning. They add incremental development, variety, support, reinforcement, and they all enhance the objectives of the landmark styles they are between. Now, the number of canopies between landmark styles is not fixed. 
It is up to the teacher's initiative and ability to design experiences that can meet the needs of the students. The spectrum is not 11 ways to teach. It is a framework that delineates the structure of teaching. Okay, Sharada, there's your introduction to canopies. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay, um, go back to the framework. In between each and every one of these teaching styles is a huge array of alternative and the and the, the the alternatives represent in terms of the decisions a little bit of a leading towards more style b let's say in this let's say in the in this in style b the individual practice style that learners instead of making nine decisions that they can only make four of the decisions. Is it still the spectrum? Is it still a style? Of course it is, but it is not a landmark style B. It is in between A and C. So we always designate alternatives differently than we do landmark styles. Because if you're doing research, you cannot say that the implications of style of the, in, of the individual practice is X, Y, and Z when someone is doing a canopy. You have to be true canopy or landmark. Now, what would you need to know in the very closing of our session? I, I've loved this. I'll, I'd continue. She could, too. She could talk all day. <laughs> What else, Sharada? What do you want? I have I have a lot of questions though, uh, but uh, time is so short. And if there are some other uh, participants who want to ask questions, in fact, I would uh, it if uh, some more people ask questions. Can we teach value through different teaching styles? Yes. Can we teach what? Can we teach values through different teaching styles? For example, can dedication be taught through all of the styles? Dedication? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, that's the whole purpose. Value, values, each of these styles represent a value. Commands, reciprocal style values socialization and communication. It values respect for another learner. It values teaching learners how to speak politely and encouragingly to another person. Every one of these teaching styles represents attributes that represent value. The whole purpose of the spectrum is to expand the way in which we can interact with ourselves and with others. Now, the reciprocal style is so very important because the teaching language is to be used when the, when the observer and the doer are speaking to each other. You don't just say, evaluate your partner. No. You have on the criteria examples of what to say and how to say it. Because we need to teach some of our learners how to talk to each other without being abusive and negative and bullying. So each of these teaching styles has its own set of values. And that's why we need to have what we call mobility ability. Mobility ability. If we can get teachers who can shift from one behavior to another to another, we'll be exposing learners to greater and far more reaching developmental effects in each of the channels of development. Okay. We also had, do landmark styles include every objective and decision structure in one lesson? Does a landmark style include every, every objective? No. There is no way that you could have that big long list of objectives and subject matter and, 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 and behavior. In one lesson, no, no. So you have to select which ones are the priorities. No, you can't. Next. If on page 
do PowerPoint. Today. Autumn. Um, I'm sorry, what did you say? PowerPoint 15. Of course, I'm sorry. Now, how will you know if you are doing, how will you know what style a teacher is using? If you look in the website on, on the resources, the research, you'll see this, you'll see this article. And this article will give you a, um, a, an inventory detailing the style descriptions so that when you look at an episode, see one of the things we need to become skilled at is being able to recognize what teaching style is a person in. And this article will help you to decide, help you to, to realize when, a, what, what is behavior is. Is it style X or is it style G or is it, what is it? But this is a good paper for, for you to use to increase your ability to look at an episode and to see what it is. I had a question from Amit. Uh -huh. What is important style or development understanding of child? Say it again. Um, what is important style or development understanding of child? Oh, so, so is style more important or is the development understanding of the child more important? I think that's um, what the question was. The spectrum is an inclusive behavior. We don't want to exclude any part of the person that could be meaningful to the learning experience. The child is important and the subject matter is important. Both need to fit together. If I understood your correct question correctly. I think so. Uh, Ami, did we answer the question correctly? Or did you get the answer needed? Spectrum is a unifying and universal. Go ahead, Dennis. You have a question? Nope. You mean I've been perfectly clear? Come on. I, I would take my time to read it more thoroughly. <laughs> Now, I have so much I want, want to cover, but I don't know what you want. Tell me what you want now. <laughs> well, uh, I have a question. I have a question. Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, it, it, it becomes difficult when we try to use um, uh, styles from G, uh, and, I mean, F, G, and H. It really mm -hmm. becomes difficult because a uh, uh, lot of decisions are taken by the students. And, uh, you know, in fact, even identifying uh, appropriate, I mean, unit appropriate style uh, right. is for us. Can you guide us on that? Go to guided discovery on the web, on the, uh, the website. Guided discovery. Is that on the website? Uh, Yes, I think so. It is true. The styles in discovery are much more difficult for teachers to use. Where is it? They are almost never used very, very rarely because people don't understand. They don't understand discovery and the different patterns for different kinds of discovery. Now go to theory theory landmark style and now go to guided now go to guided discovery okay down 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 guided discovery sorry there we go that's okay okay go to next guided discovery is a the most difficult style on the spectrum and it is the most difficult style because it's structure go ahead check because it's, okay, oh, I don't have that here. Sorry, I don't have the one that I'm supposed to have. Um, 
guided discovery is the most difficult because it is a very structured ex, um, thinking process. Imagine a ladder. And each ladder consists of a question and an answer, a question and an answer. And each question only produces one specific answer. And that answer leads them to the next question, which needs, leads them to the next answer, and so forth and so forth. Until they reach the top of the ladder and they discover the anticipated target. So you're doing this structure so that the learner will say this anticipated answer. Now, if the learner knows that answer or is familiar with that answer, it's not guided discovery. It's style B. It has to be a target that is unknown to them. It cannot be a name, a date. It has to be something that is discoverable. Guided discovery is one of the toughest because if the student doesn't give the particular, the particular answer that is anticipated for this question, then you're, you're, you're on a detour. Guided discovery is a short episode, three minutes, five minutes maximum, and it is done one-on-one. -on -one because once a learner gives his answers, the other learners in the classroom may or may not be up to the thinking. So there's gonna be a gap. But guided discovery is really, really tough. Go to the next one. So you have a series of, of ladders, of, of steps you know, on the ladder to get to the target. Now the next style, show, show the blue, show the name of the style. Convergent discovery. Convergent discovery is a different discovery pattern. Convergent discovery is one question that has one answer. And the learner has to figure out on their own the thinking process that is used in order to answer that question. It's a fun style, like a, a puzzle. Certain riddles and certain rhymes are, are um, convergent discovery. That's the second way in which the brain can be engaged in discovery, second pattern. Let's go to the next one. And again, each of these have their own separate objectives in terms of subject matter and behavior. Divergent discovery, style H. Style H stands for huge. Style H is a huge style. Let's go down to it. Go ahead. Okay, let's see what I have here. I don't think I have any pictures of this, but style H, yeah, it, I'm, oh, style H, it's, those are the only Stand two. video. Huh? Are there any other pictures? No. Okay. Style H, these are a commercial. I don't have time to show them to you. Oh, no, this video is the woman who won the art competition. I know, I know, but they're two. I just don't think we have time to show it. Oh, sure. Um, style H is one question and multiple responses by the same learner so that the learner can go divergently in terms of producing alternative unknown before designs. Take dance. Give them a list of criteria Use, using six slide movements, four jump movements, three curdle movements, da-da-da, whatever the criteria may be. Now produce a, a routine that you have not done before to satisfy that. And now once they do that, then they do another one and they do another one and they do another one. It's all about divergence, unknown, a task that is unknown to them before to be creative, to be uh, expressive. Okay. Shrada says, are these styles limited to a few students? No. Um, like, like you won't, like limited to a, like one or two students at a time. No, no. The only one is the guided discovery. But all of these others are whole class, groups of class, 
No. Young, young children, young children, older children. The older the child, the more guided, the more convergent, I mean, the more divergent discovery, the more difficult divergent discovery is. Reason? It's hard work to think. And they know that school is about giving the one right answer. So learners stop thinking once they get into middle and high school in many classes. And they say, just give us the answer, teacher. Just tell us what you want. Therefore, we need to change their way of thinking so that when they go to contribute in the society, they will not just be doing the same thing that everybody has always done. We want them to be able to produce ideas. And if you don't practice producing ideas, you don't learn to do it. Remember, the spectrum is about developing people and developing them in a very particular way. And if we can't have teachers see those four points, then we're missing the boat in terms of what we say we do. Now, in the textbook, there is a chapter on cognition and on feedback. They are a part of um, content that is referred to as the components of teaching. And those components we need to teach learners their very beginning of their academic uh, practice so that they can learn what cognition means, the range of cognition, the precision that one has to have with cognition. And, um, and then they need to learn feedback, the variety that is given. Most teachers use a lot of feedback that is not appropriate in the classroom. And both of those are essential to the development and the emotional development of our students. Next question. Okay, I think this will make this the last question because we are getting close to about two hours. Oh my goodness gracious. Oh, I apologize. Thank you, thank you. Um, so Shrada said, theoretically, is it, are these suited more for other subject areas? I, th I think I'm saying this correctly. Is it, yes. Is it what? Um, are they more suited for other subject areas? What, the discovery styles? Absolutely not. In fact, physical education is the premier. Look at all of those examples that we had of society in Style A. Those examples represented Style A slash Style H, guided, I mean, convergent discovery. They were creative activities for most of those, creative expressions, but they were performed in a style A manner. Physical education is the most brilliant for, for uh, alternative designs. Brilliant. Look at all of our competitions that we have where they want alternative movements. No. Okay. So as I said, I think that we will make that the final question. Is there any final comments that anyone would like to make? Yes, I do want to. And if anyone else wants to say anything before me, please go ahead. Well, I will. I will just say to each of you, as my first, my, my nervousness was obvious. Um, I thank you so very much for introducing me to this new world of Zooming. And thank you so much for your time and your patience and your interest in the spectrum. And I'd love to have you come and join us. And be sure you look on the website for the colleagues page. You'll see Rada. And I'd love to have more of you come and join us and learn about the spectrum. There is a difference in the classroom with spectrum teachers. There's less time on less time off task. There's less discipline problems. There's more engagement. There's more feedback, um, and the list goes on and on and on in terms of the benefits of the spectrum. Um, and I, I hope you can also experience them. And if you have any questions, email me. I'd be more than glad to interact with any of you. And thank you again. Thank you very much. for this. And thank you, my wonderful secretary. Thank you, Laura. You're welcome. Gerard, it's yours. Yes. So on behalf of all the participants and my college and my dear colleagues, um, I extend, I don't know, I, I'm falling short of words to thank you, ma'am, because uh, 
it's been a phenomenal experience for me personally. I, I met you in 2016 at uh, Lally. If you remember, uh, I don't know if you remember or not, but yeah. uh, that celebration of 25 years of the spectrum. And uh, I attended the workshop as well. And I was mesmerized by the kind of devotion that you have uh, uh, towards the spectrum and the kind of network that you have developed. And that's when I thought I should really take it up because um, I started studying spectrum in the year 2008. And I still so much to learn. And now I realize that I'm nowhere near spectrum, near the S of the spectrum. So I think uh, a lot many years for me to understand the spectrum and, you know, help my colleagues and, uh, you know, collaborate on this uh, idea. But we would certainly love to have you again and again and would love to listen. In fact, what I will do is uh, we will ensure that we study much more and come, come up with more questions and a uh, little uh, higher level discussion kind of thing. And once the things are normal, I would want you to come here personally mm -hmm. and uh, with us and it will be really amazing. I'm sure all of them will agree with that. Uh, it was a pleasure having you uh, on this uh, webinar, web not webinar, but uh, online uh, interaction. And uh, even though it was uh, your first experience, it was perfect. I mean, it was more than perfect because it was coming from, coming from you. So once again, I thank you so much. It's not only given us a lot of information, but what I feel is it has given us insight. And uh, now I think we're going to reflect much more about uh, how can we uh, apply the whole idea into our own teaching and into the teaching of our student teachers as well, their practices as well. So with this, I once again thank you and also thank Mary for uh, all the technical support and technical because it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience, you know. Thanks a Super lot. Helpful. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I really welcome the whole Spectrum team to uh, visit us to India once the things are normal. And it will be a pleasure uh, to host you all and have uh, hundreds of PE teachers coming in to learn about Spectrum. Oh, wow. How wonderful. Take it one step at a time. One step at a time. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So uh, with this, I think uh, there are no more questions, but a lot of comments. Uh, and they all want to thank you for this wonderful session. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a small group, but uh, it was amazing. Thank you once again. And I can't, I can't think of any words. <laughs> and I can't either. <laughs> it's, it's really overwhelming for me. Thank you so much for your time. Early in the morning, you had to wake up for us and, you know, uh, get ready for all the uh, session. Dennis, you want to say something? You were waving. No. Uh, I was saying bye. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. So you have a wonderful day. Wish you great health. Be safe. And uh, we look forward to interacting with you more again. Again. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Bye. bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you for joining in thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you so thank much. you everyone thank you thank you thank you mary okay well you are free to go um i will be sending the recording in just a few minutes to shrada and uh, she can distribute it to everyone else thank you ma'am thank you so much you're welcome thank you, thank you so ma much ma'am Right. Uh, just one announcement. I will be sending the certificates. What I will uh, get the design ready by oh. tonight. We get it approved from the Spectrum authorities, and then I will distribute it. Thank you, participants. This is uh, a special certificate because it's my very first Zooming. <laughs> really, you were very kind to me in this session. Thank you. And I'm always looking at this camera, and I know I'm supposed to look over here, but I can't do it. I need to see you. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. If thank you. Right with that. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>